Uh, I'm Deacon Joe Richards. I'm studying for the Diocese of La Crosse, Wisconsin. This is my, my last year in seminary, fifth year here at Mundelein. After college, I started working with, with Focus. They're a group of uh, college missionaries. Um, and that's when I, I fell in love with Christ's people, kind of developed this uh, zeal for souls, we called it there. Um, I'll call it the same thing here. Just really the sense of, of wanting to bring people to know Jesus Christ, to love Jesus Christ. Um, that was a big thing throughout my three years on staff. Toward the end of that time, though, I started getting a sense more that there was something more that God wanted me to be doing. At the same time, the priest I was with, fantastic chaplain, fantastic priest, um, a man who really loved his priesthood, loved his people, um, and there was something very, very attractive about watching him be a priest, watching him say Mass, uh, when, he, when he would hear my confession, you know, seeing him on campus. Um, there was something very attractive about that that was catching, catching enough that made me start to think, maybe this is something that uh, I, can, I can do with, do with my life. And then as soon as I, as soon as I said that, I potentially, maybe, kind of, yes, if you lead me into this, as soon as I, it, it was done for at that point, just one door after another started opening up, and I found myself here pretty quickly afterward. Um, my family's had a big devotion to St. Joseph ever since, really ever, well, ever since forever. But um, when we moved out to Wisconsin, that was a, a big part of, of him finding us, kind of, kind of the perfect house right under St. Joseph's Ridge in Wisconsin, beautiful place. Um, especially St. Joseph, how he lived a very quiet life. We don't hear much from him. Um, he just did, did what he was asked to do, took care of Jesus, took care of Mary. Um, I mean, he's su such a quiet life, we don't even, we don't even know how he, how he died or when he died. Um, but that steady devotion, that uh, focus on, on family life is, is just huge for me. That's, what I, that's really what I want to dedicate my priesthood to is the families in my diocese. Um, so yeah, St. Joseph is a model for, for a, lot of my, a lot of my professional work in the parish, um, but also in here, you know, he's, he's kind of got my back too. The human formation, I think was, was the key uh, point uh, that helped me a lot when I went to the parish. Uh, that ability to relate with everybody. Uh, because that ability was enforced in the seminary when I was spending time with my brothers from different cultures, from different states, from different areas. Just knowing how to work with people who are not thinking as I think in other things and just learning from one another. I, I think what, that was the basic thing, just learning from one another and, and be able to go out there in the parishes and be joyful and just bring that kind of joy to the people there to meet every day. We are formed to go and make disciples, to just go and make those disciples of all the nations in my own diocese. Wherever the diocese decides to put me, I don't care whether it's in the seminary or it's in the parish or administration building, wherever I will be, but having that opportunity to, to, to spread the news, the good news, just by being myself, uh, by being a joyful priest and just to love everybody. I think that's what be the main thing that I think priesthood for me will be, to serve. We are in the period where we are going down with vocations, almost globally. So the fact that there are still men out there who come here and aspire for priesthood, that's a source of hope. And people, without the support of the people outside, then these lights that are coming in will disappear if there's nobody who's supporting them. So I think it's a crucial point, crucial time where we really need more supporters for the church, especially for seminary here, where it's not only forming seminarians for Chicago, it's global. It's, it's forming everyone. Everyone can come in, but in order to explore the, the, this kind of mission of the church, then we cannot do it on our own. Uh, the, the seminar on its own cannot do it. It needs, that's why they are sending students to the parishes every weekend, in weekends, because they know we need each other. So we need that their support in order for the seminary, seminary to continue to nurture and help these young men to grow in their love of priesthood and also to be able to serve. 
uh, the society at large. Just got back from the pilgrimage in the Holy Land. Um, had a fantastic time there of, of being, being there for such an extended amount of time, uh, which gave us the opportunity to really fully enter into the experience, to pray at all these sites, um, to have mass at all these sites. And coming back, I have a, a strong picture in my mind of, of all of these um, sites from biblical history. The land itself is like a fifth gospel the scriptures come alive. You hear Je about Jesus like going up into the hills and praying or finding lonely places in Galilee um, and praying and we were able to do that. We spent um, five days in uh, on a retreat in preparation for ordination to the diaconate and that was just like really powerful because we're spending time in, in solitude where at the same places where where Jesus would have spent time in solitude and, and prayed and, and really they're also reflecting upon just the calling of the apostles that happened there Preparing for the uh, transitional diaconate, this pilgrimage, this pilgrimage comes at a time when you are left with a lot to think about yourself and the mission you are going into. And in a special way, uh, I partnered that with the retreat we had about the, uh, John 21. That was where we focused, where you know Jesus calls on Peter and says, "You know, come follow me. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me?" So those questions for me resonated first with myself in reference to what I'm preparing for, which is the diaconate. One of the things of, of the pilgrimage to Holy Land is that we go just with our class and we have nine weeks of possibilities to connect with, with our classmates, to get to know them, to um, experience uh, the beauty, of course. A couple of us had the idea, um, wanted us to bike around the Sea of Galilee I'm always up for an adventure, so we went out and, and rented bikes uh, in Tiberias and, and we thought, you know, kind of to get a full experience of what it would have been like, you hear about Jesus going across the sea to the beyond, uh, to all these different sites, uh, and, and kind of thought, well, if we biked around it in a day, we'd get a sense of, of what that's all like. You can't think about the gospel the same way as after you have gone through this experience of, uh, of eight weeks, it becomes alive for you and then you can make it alive for your people as you go to the parish and as you give reflections, as you give homilies. I'd just like to say thank you uh, to all of the donors who make this pilgrimage possible year after year. Um, it's really an incredible, incredible opportunity that I can't uh, thank you or thank God enough for, something that um, has definitely changed the way that I will pray with the Gospels and changed the way that, that I will live as, as a disciple um, and as a deacon and, and eventually uh, as a priest. And so it's something that has, has very much formed me and, and it's been a time of, of deep grace that, I, that we wouldn't be able to receive uh, without you and without your support. So thank you uh, very much for your prayers and, and, and support and, and everything you do for us. Hi, I'm Father John Carchi. If we think about these recent months we've been living through, if there's one word that comes to mind to describe them, it might be chaotic. Fear, uncertainty, violence, illness on global scales. And it's easy to see how in the face of that chaos, one might easily give in to feelings of despair or hopelessness. And certainly for us as Catholics wondering perhaps, where is God in the midst of all this? So I think at times like these, it's important to remind ourselves that our own scripture is full of examples, accounts of chaotic moments where people were face to face with fear, uncertainty, violence, illness, and they wrestled with some of those same questions. Where could there possibly be hope in the midst of this? Where is God in all of this? How should we relate to each other as the people of God in the face of this chaos? Paradoxically, in the Bible, it's often these chaotic moments that serve as sort of threshold moments in salvation history, where if in the midst of the chaos, 
people can simply remain faithful to that relationship with God, whether they understood what God was up to or whether they wrestled with it and had questions and, and maybe fought with, where is God in the midst of all this? If they could stay engaged, that chaos often was a sort of doorway into a new reality where God's kingdom was in breaking. So I invite us into four sessions where we're going to look at some of those chaotic moments in Scripture from the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we'll see how, through the wisdom of the people of Israel, in their relationship wrestling with God's role, whether we see it in the historical books or the prophets or the wisdom literature, the gospels, the epistles, how did they find hope in the midst of that chaos and fear? And I think we'll find that the wisdom from millennia ago can really be an important source of comfort and hope speaking to us today. I hope you can join us and be part of that conversation. The fact that people would support this school means that I had the opportunity to become the man who's been kind of put into all these crazy situations in life and able to bring Christ into those crazy situations. I never would have been able to do that the five years before I was in seminary. Um, that time in seminary was very special for coming to terms with who I am as a human being, to see what gifts God has given me and what ones I need to grow in. I would say for me, just about the favorite part of seminary would be really just the people who helped form me, from you know my teachers to the staff to even just my friends, the communities that we had formed here. That by far was what inspired me to take my studies seriously, to really take my human development seriously, to become the man that I was supposed to be. Seminary training is really good for just getting to some of the practicals that I was worried about. Um, and taking all those worries and just kind of getting them out of the way right away. Um, really being able to enter into the Mass, being able to pray with people at the hospitals. Even though I had never done any of those things before, Mundelein really just prepared me to have the tools to know what I was doing. And then everybody, even though they expected me to be an expert, like I could still enter into those moments prayerfully because we had talked about just about how it was supposed to look. It just kind of gave me a good sense of peace going from this place, knowing I've been given everything I need. Um, and with the addition of just like a good rounded prayer life, there's nothing to be worried about. There's like a lot of really good parts about being a priest, which is a good thing to say. Uh, but one of those things for sure would be getting to go to the hospital. Um, because even though, again, like anointing of the sick is a sacrament I have never ever seen before for the most part, had never really done. Um, even then, people always were ready to pray. Um, no matter if it was a room full of the family, relative strangers, or even just the patient themselves, I've just been able to jump into those situations, form a relationship, and guide them in prayer, which is just a really awesome experience to be able to bring Christ to others that way. And so the fact that people would choose to continue to support this school, this place, the work that's done here, um, is incredibly important so that these future men who are also maybe have their own fears or doubts or worries about their own abilities, those can all get brushed aside. We can let God's grace into those because people are choosing to make this place keep running and run in a really awesome way. Good evening and welcome to the 27th annual Celebration of Mundelein, an evening of tribute. I'm Father Jerry Boland and though we can't be together physically, virtually 
We are gathering this evening for an evening of inspiration and song to celebrate and support the seminary that we all love and its great responsibility of training future priests to serve the church. I'm deeply honored to be this year's recipient of the As One Who Serves Award ordained in 1981. I never thought that I would receive such an accolade. I'm really honored to be receiving this award. Excuse me. Oh, Father Karchi. Hello, Father Karchi. Yeah, I'm right in the middle of welcoming everyone. I told you it was Michael Bowley. What? Uh, gee, that's awkward. Uh, Monsignor Boland. Oh, that's the story of my life. Okay, thanks a lot. Sorry about that. Thank you, everybody, as we honor Monsignor Michael Boland, this year's recipient of at One Who Serves Award. We're so proud of my brother. Uh, 30 years of service as the president uh, of Catholic Charities. He has made a, quite a contribution to the life of this local church and is a proud graduate of Mundelein Seminary. I was ordained five years before him and of course I've taught him everything he knows. Uh, congratulations Mike. We all love Mundelein Seminary. We love you and we're very proud uh, that you are being acknowledged for all that you've done. Well, it's time for our evening to commence. Thanks for joining us this evening as we celebrate our great seminary. God bless you all. Good evening and welcome to Mundelein Seminary. If you've never had the chance to come out to campus, I hope you're able to come out soon. This evening we celebrate the seminary, all those men who are studying for priesthood now, and especially all those who've gone before them, our wonderful family of alumni priests. Tonight we honor a special one of our alumni family, Monsignor Michael Bolin, from the ordination class of 1986. For many years, Monsignor Bolin has worked tirelessly here in the Archdiocese of Chicago with Catholic Charities, helping to make real the presence of the Catholic Church on the streets of Chicago and beyond. The story that his life tells and the story that he'll help us tell this evening really is in some ways a snapshot of what we try to accomplish here at Mundelein. Before we begin, I ask you to join your hearts with me in prayer as we ask God's blessing upon Mundelein Seminary and our mission. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon the seminary this evening, and for all those many women and men who support us through their prayers and generosity in so many ways. We ask that you would help open our minds and hearts to be ever more mindful of the mission you call us to, and in a special way, we want to hold in prayer all those who are struggling in any way this year through the pandemic, through social unrest, that their personal intentions may be held up before you. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. It's obviously been a very challenging year for all of us, and that's why we're coming to you virtually. But in a way, there's a mixed blessing in that because it allows us to show you more of the campus and more of what we're really all about in our mission to form parish priests. It does take a lot to keep a large seminary like this running, 
but this year your generosity is particularly needed. We've been very blessed this year to have an anonymous donor offer a $50,000 challenge grant. That means that for every dollar you're able to donate, it will be matched directly one for one. Any amount that you're able to give would be hugely appreciated. Now I'd like to introduce you to one of our own seminarians studying here at Mundelein. He'll be going into his second year of theology studies, and he's a student studying for the Archdiocese of Chicago. I can't think of any better guide to take you on this tour and walk you through the story of Mundelein's mission and the wonderful life and ministry of Monsignor Michael Bolin. Mr. Kevin Gregus from the Archdiocese of Chicago. Thanks, Father Karchi. I'm Kevin Gregus, and I'll be your host for all of tonight's festivities. This is my first time back here at Mundelein Seminary since we all had to abruptly leave back in March due to the pandemic. But as you can see, campus is just as beautiful as ever. Tonight, we're celebrating the mission of Mundelein Seminary, which is the formation of parish priests. It's just as important now as it was nearly 100 years ago when the seminary was formed. I'm standing on the Belvedere overlooking St. Mary's Lake, where thousands of seminarians have spent time in prayer over the years, pondering the call of the Holy Spirit on the road to priesthood. The lake is also a place of fraternity and brotherhood, where we spend time fishing, boating, and if you're like me, playing hockey when the lake freezes over. I'm looking forward to showing you even more beautiful spaces here on our campus. But now I want to introduce you to our first special guest of the evening. He's the Archbishop of Chicago and the Chancellor of the University of St. Mary of the Lake, Mundelein Seminary, Cardinal Blaise Supich. Welcome to our celebration of Mundelein. It's good to be with you. And while this is a virtual gathering, I welcome this opportunity to thank you once again for your support of Mundelein Seminary. Our seminary community, made up of candidates willing to give their entire lives in service to God's people, keeps fresh for all of us that the church's mission is to bring humanity together as one people of God. As Vatican II reminded us, the church is the sacrament of the unity of the human race. The church takes up this mission by attending to people's spiritual needs, by our outreach through our charitable ministries, by educating children, and by preparing seminarians and others to bring the joy of the gospel to a fractured world. In these challenging days, I'm grateful for the work of our parish and archdiocesan staffs, our deacons, school personnel, and other pastoral ministers as they collaborate in keeping our various ministries open and life-giving. Yet I know that all this work would not be possible without the support of parishioners. And of course, we are all inspired by the response of our priests who pastor and serve our parishes. They quickly pivoted to live streaming our masses and have been creative in keeping parishioners connected, all the while offering pastoral care. And now they are making the adjustment to follow archdiocesan protocols to reopen our churches in a way that keeps parishioners safe. They also have been unwavering in witnessing to the gospel by speaking out for social justice and an end to racism. We at Mundelein are proud of the priests we have trained, and tonight we honor one of them with the As Those Who Serve Award, Monsignor Michael Bolin. His leadership of Catholic Charities and his service as a priest of this archdiocese offers our seminarians a vision of all the good they can do with their lives. And it serves as a lasting legacy in Chicago and throughout the Archdiocese. During his tenure at Catholic Charities and his 34 years as a priest, Monsignor Bolin has served with distinction, compassion, and generosity. We congratulate him and give thanks for his dedicated service. And as we recognize Monsignor's contributions and celebrate Mundelein Seminary, we turn our eyes to the future. Let us pray, as Pope Francis has urged, that God may continue to give us priests enamored of the gospel, close to all their brothers and sisters, living signs of God's merciful love. But also, let us take up with fresh vigor and energy the mission of Mundelein, convinced of the need to form knowledgeable, dedicated, and well-formed priests who will be capable of proclaiming God's word and accompanying God's people as together we bring Christ to the world. 
Tonight, we invite you to join us in this commitment by making a gift that will help us carry out this unique mission. Thanks to a generous $50,000 challenge grant, your contribution tonight will be matched dollar for dollar as we join in the work of supporting our seminarians from the Archdiocese of Chicago, as well as those who come from 30 other dioceses around the country and the world. We very much need your support, especially given the demands during the COVID-19 pandemic. We appreciate your sacrifice on behalf of our seminarians. They have more than matched our sacrifice, having decided to leave home and family to minister to you for the rest of their lives. They are counting on us to provide them an integrated program of human, intellectual, spiritual, and pastoral formation that will prepare them to take up that ministry. Thank you again for tuning in tonight and for helping us train your future parish priest. May God bless you all. We're blessed at Mundelein Seminary to have a great library full of timeless treasures, great works of philosophy and theology, and we even have a book sale. You can never know what you're going to find at our book sale. The Fian Memorial Library, where we are right now, was built in 1929 and includes touches all over the place from Cardinal Mundelein himself. It's basically our version of Hogwarts. Now let's check out the other side. This is the Mackesee Theological Resource Center. It was built in 2004 and was the first new building on campus since 1934. But as you can see, it fits right in. You may be shocked to find out that we don't spend all our time in the library. Priestly formation involves four different dimensions, intellectual, spiritual, human, and pastoral. Priests are not formed in a vacuum. We rely on the support and prayers of friends like you and a lot of experiences outside the seminary in parishes, as well as all of the things we do here at seminary. In this next video, you're gonna get a whirlwind tour of what life is like here at Mundelein for over 150 seminarians like myself. We come from 30 dioceses across the country. We call this place home. You'll be able to see why your support is more crucial now than ever. Mundelein has a very specific mission. Forming men to be priests in parishes. Not just of teaching, you know, not just for giving a skill set, this wonderful term called formation where you put it all together. At Mundelein, we do a really good job, particularly of learning pastoral skills and, and having that experience of being in parishes and getting to know people in that way. Part of the, the greatest joys and, and some of the greatest uh, sorrows and tragedies of their lives. But to be in that place is really a privileged place. It's necessary for the priest to be able to draw upon the knowledge that he's acquired and to see what that looks like in everyday life and then to speak to it, you know, in order to help people you know, lead to the healing and the joy and the grace of Christ. All that he has to do, though, is be creative and be flexible and be a collaborator. My favorite thing about being here at Mundelein was the fraternity, the community and the relationships. Um, to walk you know, side by side with these men that are going striving for the same goal, going through the same things as me and are able to support me was a beautiful thing and something I carry with me even today as a priest. If you pick your feet up in the river of grace and you let the river take you, you let the Lord lead you, then he's going to take you to places and people and experiences that you never would have had ever in your life. You can never construct the adventure that the Lord has for you. When we say we are Mundelein, that we includes you. We can only do this with your collaboration.
This is the newest addition to our campus, a beautiful visual reminder of God's unending mercy for all of us. It's particularly powerful right now as we've spent the last several months dealing with this global pandemic and all the uncertainty, stress, and grief that it's caused. Through everything, God is with us. As social distancing has forced us apart, the ministry of the church is becoming even more vital, and our priests and seminarians have risen to the occasion. They found creative ways to connect their parishioners to Christ through live-streamed masses, parish podcasts, YouTube reflections, virtual praise and worship, drive and adoration, and more. For those most seriously affected by the virus, parish priests answer the call to visit these COVID-19 victims in the hospital, providing last rites and God's merciful presence to them even when their own families couldn't be there. In the Archdiocese of Chicago, a group of young priests volunteered to take this role, including Father Derek Ho, a Mundelein Seminary alumnus, class of 2014. He ministered to over 10 COVID-19 patients and recently shared his experience with us. I feel like the priesthood, so much of it is not just your relationship with God, otherwise I think I would have become a monk, uh, but it is genuinely encountering God by ministering to them. And that's primarily through the sacraments, these privileged moments where we experience God's mercy or God's intimacy. And so when you, know, you hear these stories about patients who are dying alone, and you remember that your vocation is to bring God to them, well then, you know, do it. My first experience was at a, a place where they told me that they didn't know if the patient was, uh, was, uh, had contracted coronavirus. Um, what they did know was that she was dying. They assumed, it was at a nursing home, and they assumed that all of the residents had it. The p patient was um, unconscious, and I wore all of the personal protective equipment that I was assigned and did it. And it was like every other anointing that I had ever done, save for the fact that there was no um, other family members present. Usually the family's around, they are able to tell me how this person, how their loved one lived, and maybe something about their faith, and I can include that in the prayer somehow. But here, it's sort of, I mean, I know their name. I know that they're Catholic, that somebody in their family requested the anointing. But aside from that, really, um, it's one of God's children. A couple weeks after that, I had an experience where the person who was dying was not alone in their room. They had three other patients who had contracted corona. The person that I was visiting in the room was uh, very close to death. So I'm saying the prayers, and I'm very cognizant that these three other people are listening to me. And I was thinking, what, what are they thinking when they're hearing these words, go forth Christian soul from this world in the name of the Father who created you, uh, the Son who suffered for you, and the Holy Spirit who was poured out upon you, you know, go forth faithful Christian. That was probably the most moving experience for me. We're told not to do more or additional ministry, uh, but at that moment, um, I, just, I just tried to be present to them as best as I could. People need God all the time, right? But especially in moments where uh, we experience the lack of God or just hatred or violence or we experience a felt absence of God, well, we need a community to help remind us that, hey, things are going to be okay. God has been with you in the past. He's going to be with, he's with you now and he's going to be with you in the future. We can't do this alone. We can't live out our faith by ourselves. It wasn't meant to, to be that way. This is like every hardship or suffering, an opportunity to trust in God, you know. If, I think sometimes the only way to tell uh, if you have the light is if you're in darkness. And so, in some way, this has kind of been a test.
It is now my honor to introduce Dick and Mary Jean Burke, who have been on the boards of both Mundelein Seminary and Catholic Charities. They will present the As Those Who Serve Award to their friend, Monsignor Boland. My wife, Mary Jean, and I are very honored to be here this evening to participate in this wonderful recognition for the work of Monsignor Boland. Uh, he, had a, he has a vision and a leadership style which developed Catholic Charities remarkably over his period of, ahead of being administrator of it. Monsignor Boland is a graduate of St. Mary of the Lake Seminary. He was ordained in 1986. And for the next 11 years of his priesthood, he was working in parishes in the Archdiocese of the area. Towards the end of that area, he uh, became interested in Catholic Charities work and became the right-hand man to Bishop Edwin Conway, who at that time was the administrator of Catholic Charities. When in 1997, Bishop Conway moved to become Vicar General, My Father Boland then took over as head of it. And to give you some sense of the magnitude of his accomplishment, let me give you just a few specifics. In 1997, the year that Monsignor Boland came in, 
the budget was $150 million. Last year, it was $215 million. Of that, most of the funds come from federal and state contracts, but the balance must be raised by Catholic charities. For example, in uh, the year 1997, the development office raised $14 million. Of that, $5 million came from the United Way. Last year, Catholic Charities raised $25 million, and only $1 million of that came from United Way. So there's a huge growth in the development funds, which are needed to accomplish their programs in light of the shortfalls of the state and federal funding. Uh, the endowment was zero when Monsignor Boland came in. It's now at $73 million. And one of the most interesting statistics is that when he came in, there were five senior centers. There now are 21 in different areas of the city providing help for seniors. And these centers are frequently in church property, which is no longer used for their intentional usage. It sometimes is difficult to describe the work of Catholic Charities because it's not just one thing. They serve the unborn. They serve unwed mothers. They serve seniors. They serve people in distress, they serve immigrants, they serve veterans, they serve anyone that has a need. One of the more interesting statistics is that if a call comes to the city of Chicago from someone who said, I'm being evicted, I have no money, my family's out in the streets, it's automatically funneled to Catholic Charities. They step in and they step in very well and they do it. They provide professional help, socially trained people who are re reaching out in compassion to these people who are their clients. And they, they take this very, very seriously. Um, it is the it is, Catholic Charities is the largest Catholic Charities in the United States, uh, and it's recognized as such for its leadership, and that is attributable to the vision and leadership of Monsignor Boland. So it's our distinct pr privilege to be here to just call to your attention some of his accomplishments, and we extend our personal thanks to you for your work, Monsignor, and our best wishes for the future. Thank you. It too is my honor to be here to congratulate Monsignor Boland on all the wonderful accomplishments he has made during his lifetime. And I'd like to share a few of them with you. You know, a few years ago, I heard a term. A, a, we all know that the word priest is a noun. But really, a priest should be a verb. That's the programs that the priest should be following, and Monsignor Bowen has followed them in action all the time. Frontline services, emergency services, they gave food, clothing, and master level social services. Food pantries in Lake and Cook County also sharing clothing. Dinners for the homeless for 20 years, five nights a week in suburban Lake County and the city. Volunteers serve and practice their faith, serving 15 to 25,000 meals a year. St. Leo's for veterans on the south side of the city, the first in the country offering housing, clinics, and mental health services. The brand new Holy Family Villa on the south side offers services and apartments for seniors. There are 2,200 apartments. Anti-violence commitment in Austin. The Peace Center, a drop-in for students. Tolson Center, a mental health facility. 40% of Austin residents are serviced by Catholic Charities. A junior board for young adults, a Latino committee. Catholic Charities took over the House of Good Shepherd and started, continues to service uh, and combined with it a Madonna Center. The residents are victims of domestic violence. On that campus is the first licensed daycare center for the children of the victims of violence. Celebration of giving. Toys and gifts are donated at Christmas time for the needy children and adults. Last year, those gifts amounted to one, over $1 million. The 100th anniversary celebration of Catholic Charities was last year. It was a great celebration, and Monsignor Brolin loved every minute of it. So now do you understand why I call Monsignor Bolin, a verb. Congratulations, Monsignor Bolin. It is such a pleasure to be with here today honoring your wonderful work at Catholic Charities in Chicago. First, I'd like to offer my gratitude to Dick and Mary Jean Burke, uh, longtime friends of mine. My, I've known them for many years at Holy Name Cathedral and at Catholic Charities, and uh, they're very dear friends and great 
uh, mentors in so many different ways. And I know that Dick for many years was very involved here at, at Munderline on the Board of Trustees and I'm very grateful to them for this presentation of this award. Very grateful to Father Karchi and for his leadership here at Munderline and for him and for all the priests and the faculty and the staff here at Munderline Seminary. I'm very grateful to Cardinal Supic and to the Board of Trustees and all those who were a part of the, this award today. And it means a lot to me in many ways, different ways. Uh, first, it's named uh, the, the Episcopal motto of Cardinal uh, Bernadine, who was a priest who called, was the cardinal who called us to orders and uh, ordained us as priests. And all through the very beginning years of my priestly life, he was really a great mentor and a great shepherd of this local church. And his life epitomizes his Episcopal motto as one who serves because he was one who served not only here in the archdiocese, but also has a great leadership throughout the United States and throughout the world trying to offer that greater sense of peace as only a shepherd can to bring and call people around the altar of the Lord. Uh, I'm very grateful uh, for him and his leadership and for Cardinal George. Uh, Cardinal George was the Archbishop of Chicago. Uh, Cardinal Bernadine had appointed me uh, the administrator and president of Catholic Charities in, in 1996. And for many years, I was able the privilege of serving Cardinal George upon the death of Cardinal Bernadine. And Cardinal George was one who was very much, who served and who led uh, this local church for so many years and was so supportive of the mission and the ministry of Catholic Charities. This award to me also is, is just important uh, to pause and to think about uh, the great privilege it was for me as a priest to lead the Catholic Charities for so many years. It was very humbling uh, to be a part of the efforts and the work of the ministry of Catholic Charities and the service of the poor, to see the gospel alive uh, each and every day through our staff, through our board members, through our volunteers, through the many parishes throughout the Archdiocese who worked so much with us as we tried to, in a sense, all together work and to help build the kingdom of God and to bring a greater sense of peace and love and respect for everyone who came to us for help. It's important uh, for me to see that great ministry of Catholic Charities and to realize how uh, lucky I was in order to be able to do that and to be a spokesperson in many ways for those who are struggling, those who are in need uh, within the Archdiocese of Chicago. I was very grateful for the number of years I worked under Cardinal Supic and for his support uh, of the ministry and the work of Catholic Charities. But for all of us, you know, I know that Munderline in a few years will be, in a year or so, will be celebrating its 100th anniversary. And Catholic Charities was formed a few years before Munderline Seminary in 1917 by Cardinal Munderline. And his great vision was really to bring lay people with, into the life of the church and to take their light, rightful leadership roles. And so Catholic Charities Board was formed with over 300 people in 1917 and they continue to care and to minister and care for the poor. And today that board is over 650 people. And so it reminds us of the great vision that Mundelein had in entrusting the poor to Catholic Charities and to that ministry. And also Mundelein wanted his priests, uh, his seminarians and priests here to be able to learn um, not only about deepen their faith and their formation life as priests, but also that they were going to go out into the world, into the parishes throughout the archdiocese and beyond. In order to do that, to be able to work uh, and to call forth the ministries of the lay people they were going to work with and to walk with and to journey with. And so that vision that Mundelein had over a hundred years ago for each of these ministries, um, both Catholic Charities and Mundelein, are so important to recall and to think about that each priest that is ordained here is called forth throughout the country and the world where they serve to be able to embrace those parishioners, each of those parishioners, and to walk and journey with them in life. And that was Mondelein's really one of his great visions. And also to the seminarians, I would say to you that, you know, being a priest and 34 years after being ordained a priest, it is always, every day is filled with joy, the gospel joy. 
the privilege of seeing. It is really a privileged life in the sense that we are called into the most intimate moments in the life of our parishioners, whether that is the birth of a child and the baptism and welcoming that child into the life of the church, but also with their families in the sacramental life. And each sacrament, whether it's reconciliation, First Communion, confirmation, each of those moments of, of teaching, preparing, passing on the faith to them and their families and all those in the parish life. The privilege of walking with a couple, preparing them for their married life and to listen to them and to care for them and to give them guidance and counsel as they prepare for that important sacrament where the two will share that sacrament and become one. The idea of being at the bedside of those who are sick and those who are dying, and the privileged moments to be in that moment of grace, to be able to, with, to be with someone who at that moment when God calls them home. So it is a privileged life, it is a humble life, because you realize that sometimes you can think of like, well, who am I? But you are missed and called forth, and that it is important to always remember that as Cardinal Bernadine was, one who always served, that we're all called to serve and to walk and to bring Christ to others. And that is what our ministry is like as priests. And to realize, yes, it is a privileged life. It's a life filled with a lot of work, a lot of joy, a lot of sorrow at times, but it is always a life of joy because we are walking and journeying with each other. And in doing so, we'll get a chance to see every day, as St. Vincent de Paul said, to see the face of Christ each and every day in our parishioners, those who come to us for help in the celebration of the sacraments. It is no use to say that we are born 2,000 years too late to give room to Christ. Nor will those who live at the end of the world have been born too late. Christ is always with us, always asking for room in our hearts. Now it is with the voice of our contemporaries that he speaks, with the eyes of store clerks, factory workers, and children that he gazes, and with the hands of office workers, slum dwellers, and housewives that he gives. It is with the feet of soldiers and homeless that he walks, and with the heart of anyone in need that he longs for shelter, and giving shelter and food to anyone who asks for it or needs it is giving it to Christ. We can do now what those who knew him in the days of his flesh did. I'm sure that the shepherds did not adore and then go away to leave Mary and her child in the stable, but somehow found them room, even though what they had to offer might have been primitive enough. All that the friends of Christ did in his lifetime for him, we can do. Peter's mother-in-law hastened to cook a meal for him, and if anything in the Gospels can be inferred, it is surely that she gave him the very best she had, with no thought of extravagance. Matthew made a feast for him and invited the whole town so that the house was in an uproar of enjoyment, and the straight-laced Pharisees, the good people, were scandalized. So did Zacchaeus. Only this time, Christ invited himself and sent Zacchaeus home to get things ready. The people of Samaria, despised and isolated, were overjoyed to give him hospitality. And for days he walked and ate and slept among them. It would be foolish to pretend that it is easy to always remember. If everyone were holy and handsome, with altar Christus shining in neon lighting around them, it would be easy to see Christ in everyone. If Mary had appeared in Bethlehem clothed, as St. John says, with the sun and a crown of 12 stars on her head and the moon under her feet, then people would have fought to make room for her. But that was not God's way for her. 
nor is it Christ's way for himself now. When he is disguised under every type of humanity that treads on the earth. To see how far one realizes this, it is a good thing. To ask honestly, what would you do or have done when a beggar asked for food at your house? Would you or did you give it on an old cracked plate thinking, that is good enough? Did you think that Martha and Mary thought that an old chip dish was good enough for their guest? In Christ's human life, there was always a few who made up for the neglect of the crowd. The shepherds did it. Their hurrying to the crib atoned for the people who would flee from Christ. The wise men did it. Their journey across the world made up for those who refused to stir one hand's breath from the routine of their lives to go to Christ. Even the gifts that the wise men brought have in themselves an obscure recompense and atonement for what would follow later in the child's life. The woman at the foot of the cross did it too, making up for the crowds who stood by and sneered. We can do it too, exactly as they did. We are not born too late. I'm personally grateful for priests like Monsignor Boland who inspire me and all my brother seminarians in our call to priesthood. Now I'd like to introduce Ryan Brady, one of my fellow seminarians from the Archdiocese of Chicago. Before he entered Mundelein, Ryan worked for several years with Catholic Charities in Chicago and developed a close personal relationship with Monsignor Boland. He'd like to offer a few words on how Monsignor Boland influenced his life and his call to Mundelein. Thanks, Kevin. I'm Ryan Brady. I am a fourth year seminarian here at Mundelein. And before my time at Mundelein, I had the, the great honor and privilege of working with and for Monsignor Boland at Catholic Charities. Now, when I started at Catholic Charities, uh, I was in kind of a, a down spot. I wasn't quite sure what the Lord wanted of me. I wasn't quite sure where my life was going. But I had this great opportunity and privilege to work there. And the culture that Monsignor had formed at Catholic Charities was undeniably a culture that helped me discern my vocation. In the St. Louis de Merillac Chapel at Catholic Charities, second row in, second chair from the right, is where I began to discern my vocation to the priesthood. The culture that Monsignor formed there awakened my eyes to who Jesus is in my life and who Jesus is in the world around us. When I came into Monsignor Boland's office one afternoon and talked to him to say thank you, thank you, thank you for the great blessings that he's been to me and to the people at Catholic Charities, he said to me, Ryan, he goes, don't be surprised. Catholic Charities isn't just a place of hope and healing for those who come to us for help, but it's a place of hope and it's a place of healing for our employees and our volunteers as well. That place of hope and that place of healing opened my eyes to my vocation and has brought me to this beautiful campus to be a seminarian for the Archdiocese of Chicago and then eventually, God willing, be a priest in your parishes, in your homes, and in your lives. My time at Mundelein has been a real blessing. Since I've come here, my prayer life has grown exponentially. I've learned to interact with the Lord in a beautiful and intimate way. I've learned how to be a good and holy man and eventually a good and holy priest. Recently, I just had the extended opportunity to be in the Holy Land, and I've learned how to pray with Scripture in a whole new way. I can't wait to be in parishes and share those experiences. Make the Holy Land that is now alive in my heart alive in everyone else's. I have a little taste of that now through the teaching parish experience. It's been a real blessing to me to really be enmeshed with the parish experience as I learned to be a pastor and I learned to be a priest in parishes throughout this archdiocese. This is a wonderful opportunity to help contribute to Mundelein Seminary. Through the incredible generosity of an anonymous donor, matching gifts are, are offered now for up to $50,000. That is an incredible opportunity to have your generosity matched and doubled. We are incredibly grateful for your support, as I said, 
and we always will. Please know that you are in my prayers and you're in the prayers of all the seminarians here at Mundelein. Without you, we would not be able to do this. So we keep you close at heart. We pray for you every day. And we look forward to seeing you again once this pandemic is over and we're able to see each other face to face. I'm so glad you were able to be with us this evening as we were able to honor the life and ministry of Monsignor Michael Bolin. I wanna congratulate him for all he has done and all that he continues to do for the Catholic Church. Here at Mondelein, we really have a focus on trying to prepare men to be good, effective, holy, and happy parish priests. When I talk to the guys about what that means, I often hold up to them priests like Monsignor Bolin. His life looks like what we aspire to instill in our men. I hope you were able to donate this evening. It always is appreciated in any amount. And I'd remind you that this year, because of a generous anonymous donor, we have that $50,000 matching grant so that anything you can give is generously matched by them. I'd like to extend a special invitation for you to join us this coming Sunday. We'll be streaming a special mass in honor of all those medical workers who've been working so tirelessly throughout this pandemic. I'll be the celebrant, but our special homilist will be Monsignor Bolin. Please be sure to join us then this Sunday on our website. I invite us now to join our hearts in prayer to our patroness, Mary, the Mother of God, Saint Mary of the Lake. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. God bless you. Well, that's a wrap on our 27th annual celebration of Mundelein. We're really grateful you're able to join us tonight and for your continued support of Mundelein Seminary and your future parish priests. Your generosity is a hopeful investment for the future of the church. My brother seminarians and I are very thankful for your support as we prepare for the priesthood. Make sure you follow Mundelein Seminary on social media so you can stay tuned for all our future events. And we look forward to welcoming you back on campus as soon as conditions permit. May God bless you and all whom you love. Together with you in Christ, we are Mundelein. We form parish priests. Good night, everyone. Hi, Monsignor Bolin. It has been a privilege to know you, to have worked with you in so many events, to have you at so many of our family gatherings. Thank you for your wonderful service to Chicago, our community, Catholic Charities, the Catholic Church. I wish you well in Washington. We love you. We miss you. Hope to see you soon. Hi, Monsignor. It's Stephen Peg Lombardo. How you doing, Monsignor? Congratulations. Congratulations on your new position. Oh, congratulations <laughs> on your new position. <laughs> and we wish you the best of everything in Washington, D.C. And uh, we only have one problem with you leaving us, besides the fact that we're going to miss you, and Italia's going to miss you. But is there any way you could take your brother, Jeremiah, with you? <laughs> just asking, just asking. Congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. We, we are going to miss you. But we will be vis visiting you in Washington, too, so. Sometime soon. Good Look out for us. Thank you, Mike. For 30 years, you have walked this journey with us at Misericordia. It has been a wonderful journey. Some challenges that we faced, but you were always there for us, Mike. You made a difference in our lives. We knew that you would be there, that you would support us if we needed to be directed otherwise you would do that but you we were you would do it as our friend and our companion and we will never be able to thank you enough for those 30 years of walking this journey with us at misericordia we love you mike we pray that this new assignment will be life-giving for you and we know you have so much to bring to them so go ahead do it and know that you're dearly loved in chicago and we hope that you'll come back home often. 
Thank you, Mike, and God bless. Congratulations, Monsignor Boland, on receiving the As Those Who Serve Award from Mundelein Seminary, our alma mater. I am so proud of you and for your many accomplishments throughout these some 30 years that you've worked not only for Catholic Charities, but also for the Society of St. Vincent de Paul, bringing the Lord Jesus to the poor and needy in society. We're so grateful for your priestly ministry, for all the good works that you have done, really in the name of the Lord Jesus and the Church. And please know how proud the class of 1986 is of their Monsignor. God bless you. Ad Multosanos, Michael Boland.